Hello, everybody. Welcome to our um, presentations on the subject of baked in, which this is the first. Um, and uh, uh, I'll just tell you next week we'll be, uh, we'll, we'll hear from the professor of law on systemic racism in law. Um, so I'm here to introduce you to tonight's speaker, uh, Parnish. Uh, David has been at U USD for 10 years as chair of our music department. He has been and continues scholar and teacher of ethnomusicology, an arts administrator and a musician. He received his PhD in ethnomusicology from LA in 1991 with a dissertation on Indonesian music, especially Lombok which has remained. Other interests are in the music of uh, Southeast Asia, East Asia, and South Asia, and borderlands, migrant minorities, cultural politics, the anthropology of music, ethnology, world popular musics. Dr. Harnish's fourth book now in, is Change and Identity in the Music Cultures of Lombok, Indonesia. He has lectured, performed, recorded music, mostly in Asia. At USD, he taught music in world cultures, gamelan ensemble, and music, borders, and identity, among other classes. He has performed in Balinese gamelan ensembles and hundreds of concerts, playing guitar or percussion of jazz blues, Jazz, blues, reggae, rock, Tejano, salsa, bluegrass. On a personal note, a few years ago, I heard him perform in a nightclub in Bali. Well known in Indonesia, and his small band were playing. David them got up the audience and played rock guitar with them for the rest of the night. He rocked the house. Professor David. I'm just going to put up a, uh, a, a PowerPoint program and I'll get it started. Just wanted to uh, discuss a little bit about this cartoon here. Um, the traditional us. And I just stuck in Western art music uh, versus them. And this is kind of like a 19th century look of maybe Western Europe to the rest of the world, particularly the colonized world. and. You know, I, I just thought it was kind of humorous. I hope nobody takes uh, offense at it, but I hope you have a chance to look at the good guys on this side and then these other peoples over here. And of course their musics, which are different and brutish or whatever. All right. Well, the performance of music dates to the origins of humans or perhaps earlier, if we consider that other primates, birds, whales, and other spe species sing to communicate or recreate, and I think we all do, at least I do, the Enlightenment period development of fields of music constructed notions of what music is, its theories and elements, histories, and proper training for performance as embodied in and disseminated by churches, study centers, and conservatories. Here I use music in the singular because apart from early conservatives in China and Andalusia, Western Europeans articulated the emerging fields within schools of music that eventually engulfed most of the world. And music referred to these things, chamber, um, solo, uh, um, chant, of course, beginning with chant, um, and then solo chamber and orchestral music, orchestral music a little bit later in that um, uh, context all of it notated and systemized in one way or another. Opera is included in this group and it is here where we en encounter occasional overt depictions of others. One marker for racism in Western art music, which I'm going to call WAM, you see this designation here, <clears throat> is these depictions. Programs in music, and here meaning extra musical narratives in instrumental compositions, more covertly embodied similar depictions on occasion. And I say on occasion because most of what we call programmatic music has something to do with nature or love, but occasionally 
created narratives with others uh, in them. Some of the parody music and rescue operas of the, uh, uh, from the 18th and 19th century nar narrated, tended to narrate a European hero rescuing a European or Middle Eastern maiden who has somehow fallen into the clutches of a vicious and decrepit sultan and may reside in a harem. Sometimes composers parodied Ottoman Janissary music, as it was called, in these works. What was specifically Turk or Arab or even Chinese was never the point. They were simply others painted with a broad br brush and often grotesquely defined. The 19th century also saw, saw the rise of nationalism and nationalistic music. And many knowledgeable consumers of this music felt that they and their country were noble and exceptional because they absorbed the ascetic values and truths of that music. How could someone or their music in a colonized country in Africa, Asia, or the Americas possibly compare with that greatness? A disclaimer, I'm neither a specialist on decolonization nor colonization, but I've lived in several post-colonial countries and I've studied the impacts of colonization on music cultures. As I'll describe later, I'm old enough to have been able to observe ideologies inherent in schools and departments of music and how some of these are being challenged today. Decolonizing and decentering are defined differently in different fields and in different countries. For instance, a German colleague wrote that decolonizing at his institution referred to a work that contributes materially to indigenous sovereignty and to dismantle structures of colonial control. I might add, add here that neo-colonial control, that is, a force using economic, political, cultural, or other pressures to influence countries is also a barrier to overcome. In fact, before the rise of digital music sharing and social media, five countries controlled nearly 90% of all of the music in the entire world. Uh, the companies flexed neo-colonial muscles to make that happen. As articulated by colleagues globally working in the area within the International Council for Traditional Music, the ICTM, decolonizing in academia may refer to critically re rethinking theories and methods that have been imposed by hegemonic powers and too often accepted as universal. This pertains well to music, though perhaps particularly to the field of musicology, music history, because of the historic insistence on the universal and absolute messages in WAM, or to recognizing and empowering indigenous and other local epistemologies and ontologies, you might think of that as just ways of learning and ways of being, also relevant for music studies and definitely for my field of ethnomusicology, where some scholars uh, spoke for indigenous peoples, misrepresented them and their musics, and profited from it. Decolonizing approaches, on the other hand, uh, aim to decenter power hierarchies such as those between researcher, research, academic, non-academic, university, community, theory, practice, center periphery, and global north, global south. Oops. Sorry, I just lost my screen here. The definitions of what music is and who others are were promulgated by Western Europe and the systematic styles of study that we find at schools of music in Europe, the US and many countries, uh, perpetuated embedded racist ideation. The mature 19th century European colonization simply added to those depictions. The romanticism um, of the same period inspired the designation of musical genius um, re revering such composers as Beethoven, Mozart, and Bach, and heralding their wham works as having absolute value for the benefit of all humankind. And of course, they didn't really mean humankind, they meant mankind, because they weren't really thinking about women. Um, but I should say that I sometimes think these guys are geniuses too. These composers' music became canonic within music departments. <clears throat> 
analyzed and replicated over centuries. Any sound systems outside the canon might be regarded as something other than music. Musics from different countries were often not only outside the academy, but um, also outside discussions on what music is, what aesthetics are, and so forth. A similar hegemony um, became clear in the mid 20th century when some American faculty thought jazz, based on its artistic merit, should be included in curricula. Some programs begrudgingly allowed this, but only the music and mostly big band at first, rather than bebop, which was a contemporary style at that time. It was also harder to play, notate, or mimic, and it might have been too black for that time period. The fields of musicology and ethnomusicology arose in the 19th century at about the height of the colonial period, inspired by philosophical trends of education in Germany and Austria combined with evolution. The emerging theory of evolution, along with scientific racism, was used to further confirm European superiority in race, society, religion, and music. Musics of other cultures were placed in an earlier and primitive line of human development, while European music was posited as the pinnacle of human achievement. My field of ethnomusicology, earlier called comparative musicology, began around 1885. Earlier ethnomusicologists resisted some of these assumptions and were progressive for their time, advocating for scientific study and appreciation of non-Western musics. Indeed, early in this century, many framed ethnomusicology as the field that championed the oppressed, implying that musicology championed the oppressors. My apologies to musicologists. Implying that it's, you know, neither position was really correct. One reason for the colonial interest in musics of the oppressed was the colonial period itself, which brought new foods, ideas, dress, art, images, and music to Europeans. Industries there sprang up to take advantage of fads as they developed. Sometimes other musics and cultures were parodies, as already mentioned, and that made money too. A fascination intersecting with notions of exoticism and the novel inspired adventurers to use their white privilege to travel the world to seek cultures and performing arts of colonized lands in Africa and Asia. Europeans in general knew very little about their colonies and depended upon diplomats and missionaries, travelers and traders to acquire knowledge or products. As accounts, images, and soon recordings of um, were, were brought to these early ethnomusicologists, they were compared with WAM because it was called comparative musicology, so you needed to compare these musics, but they used Western language and Western categories, and they were naturally confirmed as unsophisticated and again, even primitive. The word primitive was definitely in parlance to define musics in indigenous peoples, and the term was still used into the 1950s and 60s. Primitive musics were considered strange arts of lower development that were either inspired by or appealed to baser instincts or part of, part of an exoticized Edenic vision of uncorrupted social life free from the burden of civilization. And sorry for the phone call there. Here are two ethnomusicologists, uh, early photos of early ethnomusicologists. Uh, one of them is Frances Densmore on the right that it's possible some of you know who she was. She was an anthropologist, worked with the Bureau of American Ethnology uh, for much of her career. And let's look at her first on the right here. This is Mountain Chief, a chief of the Blackfoot in 1916, singing uh, into a graphophone um, um, device for recording sound. And uh, Densmore didn't have a, a strongly colonial type of agenda, I'll put it that way. Um, but it did support her career, uh, and she, but she did have a respect um, for the people she was studying, and also for Native scholars uh, beginning around the 1990s, they have really harvested her recordings. She recorded thousands of songs, and they've been really important to Native Americans themselves uh, researching um, music, their own music and music of their ancestors. On the left is a slightly more problematic character, uh, Vita Chenoweth, somebody I met and I respected in New Guinea in the 1960s. 
uh, she worked with a Bible school and her job was, I mean, both to study music when uh, she traveled, particularly in New Guinea, but also to translate the Bible into the local language and teach literacy. So the first book anyone read was the Bible because it was part of her job to sort of convert people um, to Christianity as well. So these are uh, kind of an example of two different sorts of agendas at work. The element of harmony was mostly absent in world musics, but was key in classical and romantic period wham. And this point proved to colonists and musicologists that world musics were indeed under development and unsophisticated. British and some other European scholars, however, often found art musics. And here we're talking about elite musics that require a systematic study in other countries, for example, in India. And some began to call for a systematic study of those musics. So there was like an art music and then there was traditional music and then there was primitive music, these different categories that were created. Anthropologists uh, such as Francis Densmore um, conducting ethnographic field work became contributors to the new field, often at native reservations here in the US as did, as did psychologists and philologists and others as many scholars outside of music were fascinated by foreign sounds and what they might represent. There was often resistance to the emerging field because of a suspicion of cultural and musical difference permeated, permeating parts of Europe and the United States. On the other hand, despite the fascination with cultural difference available via colonization, exclusion characterized these societies and exoticism became commoditized as images of others were owned by European and American colonists or opportunists to make that. Among early eth ethnomusicologists interested in exploring the world, privilege was always pre present and allowed a mobility impossible for anyone else. I experienced that privilege as well in, uh, during my ear early field work period, despite the fact it was in the 1970s and, and 1980s. Um, but uh, the people I was describing earlier, these were of course, white European and American studying, defining and speaking for musics of others without accountability or citing local interlocutors. This problematic method and approach continued long after the colonial period into the 1970s. Many opportunists, uh, opportunists sought to define others. Some of you may be familiar with Orientalism by Edward Said. He really gets into that uh, idea. Uh, crafting and marketing recordings and exoticized images of others for their own benefit and profit. Some ethnomusicologists similarly made money by through the recordings they produced and becoming specialists often without compensating or attributing their partners in the cultures studied. So my field is part of a colonial legacy as are all fields of music and probably all academic fields. Though many in the US and, and Europe have been working to disassemble unequal relationships and to fully collaborate with partners in the field. I would say that began in the 1990s, that kind of shift. In addition, more BIPOC individuals gradually entered academia to specialize in music fields like ethnomusicology, changing the dynamic and insisting on dismantling vestiges of racism, which was often an up, up, uphill battle and still is. Beginning uh, again in the 1990s, late 19th uh, 20th century, Musicians in developing nations began to disabuse the academy and of ethnomusicologists of speaking for them. These are voices that seek to be heard today rather than by their white European or American surrogates. Labels such as world music and ethnomusicology have become problematic for their delimiting power, isolating musics and peoples outside of the canon of wham, essentially marking them too as others. Before I discuss more directly about what a decolonizing music department or, or decentering a curriculum might look like, I need to define what diversity meant in the early 1990s when I first became a professor. WAM was always emphasized uh, and often the sole content of study. Sometimes a jazz or occasionally a non-Western ensemble was offered for non-majors in particular, and sometimes for majors. Uh, these often brought more FTE, essentially more resources to the department, 
and accreditation firms strongly encouraged such innovations. Uh, these new opportunities piqued the interest of many music administrators, as you might expect. Hiring women, surprisingly now, in retrospect, scored points and was still a big deal. That was called a diversity hire, hiring a woman. Um, particularly if you hired them in, uh, if they were hired in a more masculine territory, such as orchestral conducting or music theory. There were very few theorists and very, very few orchestral conductors that were women in those days. Under the banner of diversity, diversity some BIPOC PhDs were hired as well, though the path toward tenure was always difficult as it was for a lot of women, and let alone getting in the path into a doctoral program, and particularly if they specialized in some other musics. Uh, but if a department could hire a black woman, for instance, they could check two boxes of diversity with one hire. The administrators were still overwhelmingly white and largely male and seemed reluctant to give up their power and influence, which was supported in turn by most of their faculty because they too were involved with WAM and comfortable marginal marginalizing others and diminishing the achievements of women in music. The feeling with, was, and I saw this happen, that everyone should show allegiance to WAM even if they entertain some interest in other music. These positions have become, or are in process of becoming, untenable in most US music departments. Women, of course, have become administrators, broken down barriers to absorb other masculine areas like percussion, and crafted women's music curricula and programs. LGBTQ individuals have been empowered to develop curricula and challenge uh, heteronormativity in music studies and queer theory became an area carved out by these individuals in the 1990s. BIPOC individuals have, of course, assumed more authority to teach WAM and or ethnomusicology and move forward to become administrators as well. The Society for Ethnomusicology, which is the largest organization in my field, gradually diversified its elected leadership over decades until because of the demands of the body, they decolonized their mission and their entire executive board just last year. When we bring up decolonizing, it's important to understand how complex, widespread, and embedded racism and bias are. And these are not confined to white people ignoring, speaking for, or misrepresenting, or representing musics of others, but can be intracultural and related to social class or religion. Discrimination takes many forms. It took many years um, for Indian films, uh, films of India, uh, and its popular music to be designated as music of India, for example, despite the 1 billion fans, because the music was considered locally and internationally as lowbrow. And Indian folk musics were ignored because they were restricted to lower caste, while art musics were higher caste. Similarly, courses on the sound worlds of Islam may stick with orthodoxy overlooking Sufic or Shia forms. And many scholars were surprised by the recent development of Taqwakor, which presents alternative interpretations of Islam within a punk anti-status quo ethos, and by the emergence of polycultures within some societies that have been presented as singular music cultures. India is only one uh, such uh, example of this reductive assumption. Our notion of Muslim communities precludes the development of metal or punk scenes or subcultures. Um, and ethnomusicologists for a long time focused on Arab art musics or Islamic recitation, ignoring the possibilities of the developments of such popular music scenes. And that these scenes could be used uh, for decolonizing, to fight for decolonizing, or that traditional musics and hybrids could represent resistance in decolonizing resources through performance alone. Similar biases exist within music specializations. My primary area is Indonesia, uh, primary research area. Um, one bias that persisted until just about 10 years ago is that Indonesian music is gamelan, gamelan ensembles and only gamelan ensembles. Uh, and that music associated with Islam could not possibly be Indonesian music because uh, 
uh, Islam was inherently non-Indonesian, even though it had been present in Indonesia for over 500 years. This and similar barrier, barriers have been gradually coming down. Meanwhile, many musicians and scholars in various countries are channel, challenging essentialist notions of images promulgated by Europeans and Americans over time, including by composers, musicologists, and ethnomusicologists. And with the United, within the United States, many scholars have been working to prevent the writing out of BIPOC pioneers and voices. Currently, decolonizing musicology, music theory, and music education efforts are all underway. In the US and most countries, major, major degree programs have emphasized music theory and performance with some music history and rudimentary composition and conducting. This curriculum upheld earlier precedents enshrining the genius of select Western composers and the hegemony of Wham. And of course, this preference was reflected in the formation of symphonies, chamber ensembles, opera troops throughout the country supported by grants at the federal, state, and city levels. These forms represent high art and are deemed essential to our culture. Graduate at music programs might go on to become professors and then perpetuate the program with few BIPOC or women involved, which creates a closed and rotating cycle. The goal has been to develop musicianship and competence in reading and analyzing music and impart something of the major composers and historic developments in music forms and elements and a bit about composition. And wham music styles are of course propagated in music scores, I'm sorry, film scores, live action and animated movies, theater and dance, advertising, and most all facets of American life, continuing Western narrative emotional connections between characterization, action, emotion, behavior, and style. We accept these as part of our culture and have been doing so for 150 years. Thus, decolonizing music programs is problematic. Music curricula, for the most part, have not challenged the relative American ignorance of its indigenous and minority peoples or of any cultures outside the scope of Europe. As mentioned earlier, in the mid to late 20th century, jazz, ensembles and academic courses penetrated the curricular shell in many schools and a random world music course often taught in, not by an ethnomusicologist, but say, by a musicologist or music educator might be included in a program, at least for non-majors. These programs weren't identical and there were some stronger ones and weaker ones, uh, but of course they didn't decenter the, the program or uh, the curriculum at all. Um, the definitions or the definitions of what music is. And they continued to propagate music ideologies linked to notions of evolution and culture from the 19th century. There are exceptions to this formula. Oops, I think I'm a little bit behind here. Here we are. Um, for example, UCLA created an undergraduate ethnomusicology major before the end of the 20th century. I did the same at Bowling Green State University and several others were developed before the turn into this century. Many my undergraduate college neither offered nor acknowledged any music outside of WAM, not even jazz. I was fortunate to complete uh, my master's degree at University of Hawaii where I could see integrated undergraduate and graduate music programs, along with dance and theater programs that included local voices and musics on an equal basis with WAM. So that was an exceptional program. My doctorate at UCLA and the various universities in which I have taught showed me something of how to develop courses and alternative programs softening, but not replacing WAM. I learned that progressive movements toward de decolonizing curricula and programs are always spearheaded by individuals using agency to shake up a system and finding collaborators to further that mission. There are other systematic or systemic problems. School administrators by and large commoditized and bureaucratized in the 1990s. And you know, some of us are familiar with the administrative glut um, that began uh, around that time. It is more and more administrators being hired. Um, and they commoditized, yeah, right. And again, after 9-11, 9-11 was a, another pivotal moment uh, after that, at least in music, and I think other fields as well, um, 
the politically conscious movements that had emerged earlier in ethnomusicology and musicology. And during that period, you know, there was new recognition of, of, of BIPOC and women and gay contributions. Um, the early 21st century was depoliticized and less reflective. There was a move to make curriculum more practical and vocational, more responsive to the growing conservative segments of society and generally restricting innovation, which presented Rick risk and might be considered even un-American somehow. The 2010s saw an acknowledgement of colonial roots in music fields and more scholars questioned school and curricular practices. Another movement was exploring how to make a field like ethnomusicology more about everyday worlds instead of remote, remote exotic and othered places. In the meantime, music centers and, and programs began efforts to recruit and support BIPOC, music, uh, BIPOC musicians and scholars, allowing greater access to perform and, and knowledge of uh, WAM rather than decentering it. So it's just offering people more opportunities, more BIPOC and more diversity, but not shaking the content. They're, they're still perpetuating um, the canon. However, some of the individuals are bringing different takes to that canon as that moves along and introducing more contemporary musics, which presents a different type of continuum. When I came to USD in 2011, the music department primarily offered mu music courses in WAM, though jazz and American music courses were part of the regular curriculum. We had earlier offered some popular music courses, but weren't any longer. The USD Jazz Ensemble was in its second year, and Chris Adler occasionally taught world music and performed on uh, the Thai instrument, Ken, on campus. We were ahead of some institutions, but behind many others, and had just one ethnomusicology course and no programs. As my colleagues expected, I, with them, worked to diversify our curriculum with, new, with a new undergraduate course, two new upper division courses, and two new ensembles, Gamelan and Mariachi. And I have to call out to Alberto Pulido, whose help was uh, it was absolutely essential to develop the mariachi. But I did not really center, decenter our curriculum, just provided more options uh, that might attract, you know, that might fit into the major and minor and attract more, uh, more general USD students. The fact that I was a white male may have facilitated some of this development. Over the last few years, however, with assistance from select faculty, we did decenter our curriculum by making those courses more prominent in the program. One lower division course and multiple upper division courses in ethnomusicology are now required for the music major and minor. That has decentered our curriculum, certainly, and balanced it, though only de slightly decolonized it. We need to consider pathways forward to further listen to voices historically excluded by structural inequalities, to find pathways to decolonize teaching methodologies and develop more collaborative forms of knowledge production and engaged artistic creation. Music and the other arts should be a means of celebrating human diversity. I am retiring, so it will be up to the next generation to carry forward on some of these endeavors. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, does anybody have any questions for David? Hi, everyone. Thank you, David. I really, I feel like I learned a lot and I really appreciated your, your recounting of the colonial legacy of ethnomusicology and all of these various instances of, um, you know, the colonizing force. Um, it's interesting at the end that you mentioned bringing in these new ethnomusicology classes and the gamelan um, as a way to sort of decenter and decolonize. Um, but I think it even goes even deeper than that. And I was hoping that you could comment. I'm not looking for a solution per se, but I was hoping you could comment on the idea of decolonizing performance in world music ensembles. Because even if we have these things, often, I mean, take Gamelon for an example. Um, it's great that we have Gamelon, but the ways that we perform them, you know, indoors, on a stage, um, with a boundary between performers and and the audience um, is not true to cultural context and in and, and ways that they would normally do it. So 
I think it's, it's a really interesting discussion. Like it, it's, it's multi-layered and I just thought maybe you had a few thoughts about it. Well, I do. And it, you know, it's really difficult. Um, that's a difficult question because we've kind of, you know, we've, we've used the, the campus, we've campusized um, um, ensembles that uh, normally would not have a part. Now, I, I guess we could also add that, uh, you know, around the world that universities in various cultures have, are now staging, they're, they're actually contributing to this as well and they're putting their own musics on stage um, and also having new composition. I do think that new compositions in that format can be enlightening. Uh, and it can, it can remind everybody that we're not necessarily doing traditional repertory. So we're not necessarily replicating the culture. And of course, when you use what's sometimes called ethno drag, right, dressing as in the custom. And I've been, I don't know if guilty is the right word, but I, it, the idea being, my point of view was always, let's try to have the students experience as much of the culture as they can have a salamatan. Megan knows what that is. It's a, you know, it's a feast. Um, before or immediately after, before practical reasons, we couldn't have it beforehand. But musicians in Indonesia, before a performance, will have a feast together. It's a way of creating a kind of solidarity um, that is really absent, and there's no other way to really do that. And uh, so we, again, it's a replication, uh, transplantation uh, uh, into this format. Uh, so there, there are problems like, for example, if you stage Native American music, I, in my opinion, that, that can be problematic, particularly sacred musics. And it doesn't matter the, the tradition here, but staging sacred musics provide something else. I do like our all, all faith service because there's a great deal of sensitivity put in to those presentations. You haven't attended that mega, but a lot of people here have. Um, however, this, this is a it's a very difficult issue. Now, one way we can go about it, and Megan knows this, uh, uh, some of you do too, is taking people to the country right. and actually performing. Like one thing we've done in some of the courses uh, we've done abroad is having our students perform at, for example, a temple festival to actually have the experience of doing that. Um, and the respect that's garnered from the people who are there, who are present, watching that happen. Of course, they're kind of put, they're, they're, they're made objects. You know, there's a lot of experiential things happening at that very moment. But, you know, we can't ever really get away from the fact, and we shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't, we should always acknowledge we are not part of this culture for the most part, you know. We're replicating it and appreciating it and trying to understand what it is and what performers go through when they, when they have, uh, when they, when they're engaged in, and the types of meaning, meanings that are generated from performance in the proper context. So the decontextualization is something that goes uh, along with putting a program in a university in the first place. But you know, I'm, I'm also kind of intrigued that I see it happening uh, around the world that these various countries are doing it to their own musics. And it begins to have a different kind of more secularized meaning. There's new many meanings that are generated, more global, more modern meanings, that come out of those types of encounters. Sorry, that's a really long answer, and I hope I got to your question somewhere. In no, there. I thank you. I really appreciate that point. Um, that you're right. Like a lot of these things that weren't traditionally on stage are now on stage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I had a question, David. About um, at one point you mentioned your own field experiences in the '70s and '80s, and uh, encountering um, privilege. Uh, and uh, and I, I just wondered if you could give us a that, you know, like give us some ideas of what happened on your field experience during that time. Yeah, well, we were given access, you know, uh, there are some cultures that are not so uh, accommodating to foreigners or white privilege or are suspicious of it. I'll put it that way. Even in the 70s that it happened. I mean, they, if they had a bad experience with colonization, for instance, and I'm thinking of a place like Myanmar or Burma, as it was called in those days. Um, uh, even India had a number of barriers put up where it was difficult to penetrate. Um, but Indonesia, on the other hand, uh, white privilege was kind of all over the place. And there was a history of it happening during the colonial period where white people in Indonesia could do anything. They could get away with murder, I think quite literally, uh, depending on who they are and who it was they were murdering. Uh, but you know, 
pedophilia was common uh, in Bali, for instance. It's a, it's a sad story. And uh, nobody was ever brought to justice. Um, so, I mean, there's these kinds of issues. They could get away with it because they were foreigners and they were kind of aligned with the Dutch colonial government. Uh, uh, it was colonized by Holland. Um, Indonesia was, that is. And th those types of privileges remain. Now, if you were a high administrator in the government, you also had a lot of privilege uh, because Indonesia was kind of a hierarchical structure uh, politically and allowed the people at the top to also kind of bump everybody else out, of, get to the front of the line, right? I could always go to the front of the line. I mean, sometimes people wanted to use whatever agency they had to make my path a little more difficult. Um, and I kind of, I was annoyed uh, at the time, but uh, now I look back at it and I understand what they were doing. Why should I be given preference over somebody local who's trying to do the same thing as I am? I could get access to the most intimate ceremonies uh, and gain access to the greatest musicians. Um, and, you know, that comes along with being, because they knew, you know, to some extent, they may know there was some benefit for them in the trans in that transaction. So, I mean, there might've been a little bit of that, but I really think it's really just white privilege that extended until people began questioning, you know, why are we compromising ourselves? And particularly, you know, um, an old story uh, in Bali, going back to Bali, you know, the, I hate to call out Australians. I don't know if we have any uh, chiming in right now. But, you know, Australian people going in the temples wearing bathing suits. I mean, you can't be more disrespectful than that. And it was only in the 1980s when some people started saying, you know, you really shouldn't do that. Um, and so one of the things I pointed out to my students when I took them abroad is, is being aware of their own behavior. And I know I'm off the topic here, but not using that agency that comes with white privilege. Uh, and really respecting the culture in a new way because you get a lot more back. You know, Hawaii, living in Hawaii was eye-opening as well. The, the doors that began to shut as people be, became tired of white people controlling the sovereignty of the nation of Hawaii. And, uh, you know, among Native Americans, this, this was implanted also, I think, earlier than in a place like Indonesia. So each country is a little different. That's a long way of saying that. But I know that I experienced that privilege. And I know that people uh, automatically respected who I was simply because I was male and I was white. And uh, that's not so happening so much anymore. But in the 70s and 80s, uh, I didn't know it at the time because um, I didn't reflect on it. But it's, it's become obvious to me over time. I just had a quick question. Um... You were saying how when you studied, there weren't too many um, ethnomusicology classes. And I was just wondering how you kind of learned about it and chose that that's what you wanted to do, like before it kind of became a common or super available option. Uh, I think that's great. That's a great question. Um, uh, the 1970s was when ethnomusicology got to be a little bit more popularly known. I mean, in, at UCLA, it was well known in a few other places, but. Uh, not widespread in the United States um, very much, uh, except, you know, the society itself, which began in the mid-1950s. Um, but uh, my uh, major, and it, because I was blocked from doing what I wanted to do at the music program at my undergraduate um, uh, university, so I actually majored in international studies. Um, and... Um, you know, that department, the, the music program was just way too conservative for me. And I was just a, always a little bit different, I guess. And um, so I ended up kind of getting into it myself. Uh, I, I developed, um, you know, a, a senior thesis on ethnomusicology, began to become aware of it. There were very few courses anywhere in the country, and they were always restricted to graduate programs in the 1970s. There were none at the undergraduate level, except perhaps at UCLA, maybe Wesleyan, uh, possibly later at University of Washington, um, as graduates from UCLA began to set up these programs. That is agency. As it spreads out, it goes with it. Um, so anyway, that's a, just an example of that. Uh, and it began to just uptick over time. Um, and you, there was a token kind of course uh, here and there, but nothing that got really very deep. It was survey level things. Actually, Emily, you're in a survey course with me. Uh, that's a survey course. I try to get deeper but there's only so deep we can go. So this is a, a brief inter introduction. Um, but in the 1990s, I think, in the late 80s, uh, things began to change. Uh, 
as you became, uh, you know, the, the world began to shrink, so to speak. Uh, a new level of globalization and technology were making things possible uh, that hadn't been possible before. Um, and things have developed a lot, I think, in this last decade. Um, so thank you for the question, Emily. I hope I got your question. Thank you. I think it was a very, very compelling, very interesting talk. But I wanted to, uh, well, I just wanted to point out, I think it was really valuable that you mentioned uh, the culture of film music and popular music in general, because I think one of the things that we're currently experiencing within, acad within academia is a sort of radical critique of of uh, sort of the strategies by which we teach and present and study music, but that radical critique often doesn't acknowledge that we exist within a broader musical culture uh, over which we in academia have very little control. One of the things I like to teach my students is about is the kind of tropes that appear in film scores and in TV and in advertising that actually reinforce very conventional kind of representations, cultural representations, often like outright stereotypical or offensive representations, that there's this kind of broader musical culture that we exist in that's that's uh, sort of conceptually very conservative. I'm curious if you have any thoughts about that. I thought that was a useful that you brought that up. Yeah, it, it is part, uh, you know, the uh, baked in is a part of the series title and it is baked in notions of what music is from the 19th century. And of course, Chris, as a contemporary composer, you're, you're very aware of, of all of that, uh, fighting against the tide of um, sort of rejecting um, anything immediately reflecting uh, contemporary sounds or shaking that system. And it, it is perpetuating and it perpetuates beginning in music programs. And then of course it comes from all media and all communications and entertainment. Uh, so it is kind of hard to shake it. I do think, you know, some, we shouldn't probably forget about the possibility of, of popular music and jazz and hybridity introducing no, new notions of conveying emotion. Um, once it, you know, it starts coming into play, it begins to shake the system up and maybe allow for more possibilities. Um, you know, I did a project once on early world, world music, and I don't really like that term anymore, but kind of stuck with it for now. Uh, in uh, Hollywood films in the 1930s and 40s and 50s and 60s, and the kind of tracing the development, there wasn't a lot of progress, I wouldn't say. I think the technology and the sound value got better. Um, and occasionally there was something called color music. And this is for film buffs, you know, that's where you're, you're watching uh, uh, music happen in a film, and they're actually having you hear that music as it happens or represents, represented in kind of a, a fairly accurate way. Um, though that, that color music element only came into being really in the 1970s, where, you know, some local music actually happened to convey a, a place, a sense of place. Um, anyway, another long answer, but I do think things have gotten a little better. Contemporary music is at the threshold, I think, of pushing new connections, new emotional connections to certain kinds of scenes and narratives that uh, previously would have been impossible. And can, I would argue that popular music and maybe jazz and again, hybridity, that all these different hybrid forms that come between them are doing it too. But in the meantime, you know, the big epic films, we've got the big orchestras pounding home uh, the themes, right? Yeah. Uh, and they are moving, you know, they move us. It's still, we don't have to get rid of that necessarily, but it's nice to allow other types of music to, um, to begin to convey similar types of ideas, but maybe shaded in a different way. So maybe in the future, the next generation will catch on to this and move it farther. Well, thank you, David. You've provided a whole uh, historical background and uh, ethnomusicological background and brought it all up to date. Thank you, David. That was great. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Fred. Thank you for inviting me. And thank you to Lindy and the Humanities Center. And thanks for everybody uh, coming. It was great to have everybody. And